Okay, can I go ahead and start? Yes, sir, you can. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm really honored and delighted to be invited by AgriVision to, to share my thoughts on a very, very uh, transformative uh, technique that is uh, literally, uh, <coughs> literally taking over the plant breeding and plant genetics uh, crop improvement around the world, including India. It's a new technique called genome editing. So I just wanted to share with you what are some of the applications of this technique in Indian agriculture, uh, giving some examples on how it could be useful in specific instances, and also talk about how we can, as scientists, how we can contribute to greater understanding of this technology and hopefully its acceptance. So genome editing, to, to place it in context, we must understand that we've been changing our food crops uh, for almost 10,000 years. Ever since we walked out of the caves and we started uh, beginning agriculture in many parts of the world, we literally took all the weeds, uh, the wild plants that were growing around us, and slowly through selection, a slow process of selection, we domesticated them and improved all of our crop plants, all of our wild relatives of crop plants into crops. Uh, just to give you an example, this, on the top panel you see this is how the banana looks like in the wild. And you can see how the banana looks now. And a more dramatic example on the right here, I see, uh, I show you how a maize or corn looked uh, before its domestication. Its wild relative Teosinte looked like a pencil and we all know what corn looks like now. And so this process of change has been happening all the time uh, since the dawn of agriculture. But more recently, using scientific plant breeding methods uh, in the past 100 years, we have practiced several uh, methods of breeding, including mutagenesis, uh, hybridization, and that is a, a very important uh, reason how why we have been able to to feed this humanity even though our world, world, world population has developed so much we've been able to do a very good job in feeding that uh, through scientific agriculture and uh, plant breeding through many of these techniques has been very important the transgenic breeding or the use of gmos was developed in the early 80s and the first gm crops were uh, released in 19 96 in the US and 2003 in the in, in India and uh, they have been uh, been now been practiced the GMO crops been practiced for more have been grown for more than 20 years the genome editing which is uh, essentially uh, invented uh, about 10 15 years ago involves a very is it, it, it essentially represents a continuum of all the techniques that we have been using. And so the when you, the GM crops, the, the, the BT cotton is one of the most, it is the only crop that is grown in here in India. And you can see if on a crop, on a cotton crop that is unsprayed, that you see on the right, uh, you can see a complete 100% destruction. This is an extreme, extreme example, but it's not uncommon to see a, a cotton crop that is completely devoured by bollworm, but on the left you see the GM or BT cotton how it protects. And again, a similar example I show you with the, the corn against the fall army worm. And so, compared to the GM crops, which involves an introduction of foreign gene, gene editing represents a much finer approach and it involves much smaller changes. And this is very precise, very targeted. And it, if you are, if, if you are following the first two techniques, the SDN1, SDN2, it does not introdu introduce any foreign genes in it. And, and so this gene editing is very similar to the classical mutagenesis. And in many countries, in, including India, as long as no foreign genes are introduced, genome edited crops or gene edited, edited crops go through much less regulation. In other words, they're not regulated as GMOs. And so this is one of the biggest attractions for many of us, especially those of us working in the universities, because we do not have to 
to go through very high burden of regulation. And in fact, in many countries, even GM crops are not even allowed, especially in many European countries, as you know. And India has not approved any GM crop other than cotton. But on the other hand, there is a, a the genome edited crops uh, are, are very attractive because this can be developed very faster and it is, there is a cost of uh, development is also much less. And then most importantly, the public acceptance and regulations, there is much ease compared to the GM crops. So what, what can genome editing do? And it can, we can alter many, many traits. One of, one of the most important traits that are being altered through genome editing is the introduction of disease resistance. Here you can see tomato, uh, a controlled tomato on the top with powdery mildew and this genome uh, edited uh, uh, crops, you can see there's 100% resistance to this very important disease of tomato. Similarly, just, just this week there was a publication coming from Africa uh, where they were able to take a, a banana and just knock one important gene out through genome editing and they were able to develop a banana that is resistant to a very important uh, wilt uh, that is an important, uh, very destructive disease across Africa for banana. And similarly, uh, a, a citrus resistance to canker has been developed and uh, this is a bacterial spec resistance in tomato and you can see a very how uh, damaging this disease could be on the left panel in a wild type in a gene edited uh, tomato you can see very high resistance and again we can also improve quality traits and this is one where a banana that is non-browning uh, and uh, and slow ripening uh, has been developed through uh, gene gene editing and moving forward uh, uh, rice is an important crop a lot of work in, including India is going on on genome editing and this is one example where a deadly blast disease uh, where scientists were able to develop a resistance to that through a few alteration of few nu nucleotides in the rice genome and there's another disease which is also very rampant in India it is, is a bacterial blight disease of rice and again you can see there has been uh, a resistance to this developed very early on. And uh, another very important work on gene editing came from Indian Institute of Rice Research at Hyderabad, is where, where gene ed uh, that they were able to take the Samba Masuri, a very important rice variety, as you know, and they were able to, to increase yield by about 20, 30 uh, percent in, uh, in this uh, particular rice variety, which is again a very, very encouraging uh, uh, research uh, it coming from India on a crop of very high importance to not only India, but across Asia. And uh, it's not just qualitative traits like uh, disease resistance that could be increased. Uh, one could also work on quantitative traits, which are polygenic in nature uh, and uh, genome editing of uh, uh, multiple genes can increase the size of the, the grain uh, here in, in wheat, as it is shown. And uh, editing six genes improves the size even further. And uh, uh, one other very important uh, uh, trait that could be altered is the plant architecture. As you know, the Green Revolution was primarily uh, achieved by transformation of the height of both wheat and rice. Uh, by development of dwarf varieties of wheat uh, in cement and later in Erie and other places, dwarf varieties of rice helped achieve green revolution. And this is again to show by genome editing, we could do the sh same uh, where we can uh, alter the plant architecture, as you can see here in the case uh, of a, a wild a, a cherry plant, a, a relative of tomato. And uh, one other trait that could be improved is also the nutrient efficiency. And we know in India, one of the negative effects of Green Revolution has been the very rampant and pervasive use of fertilizer leading to many ecological problems, including soil degradation and uh, loss of soil fertility. And 80% uh, of the fertilizer we use on our crop plants gets uh, washed off and uh, in runoff. And so if we increase the, the nitrogen 
phosphorus and potassium uh, use efficiency, we can cut down the amount of fertilizer that we use in that way we, 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 by making the plants more efficient in the uptake and utilization of nutrients. And there are again many very examples of that uh, in, the, in the literature in the past few years. And uh, moving forward in the quality traits, and we about 50% of the fruits and vegetables grown in India are thrown away because they perish because of the lack of uh, uh, storage, a lack of marketing, and lack of processing in many of our uh, rural areas. But if we can delay the ripening of many of our plant, uh, of vegetables and fruits, including potato, tomato that is shown here, we can improve, we can conserve improve and help improve the marketability of these crops. We can keep it for a longer time. A potato which ripens and gets perished in about two weeks, we can extend that window to about three or four weeks. Moving forward, uh, scientists have also developed golden rice and golden uh, bananas with improved uh, vitamins using gene editing. And as you can imagine, this is going to be a, a very dramatic uh, uh, biofortification uh, addressing a very serious uh, challenges that we face in many developing countries, uh, increasing lipopin content in tomato, and uh, and knowing diabetes is a very big important problem, especially in India, and and in Indians we consume a lot of rice, and uh, uh, gene editing also has potential to to develop low glycemic index rice, and this is just again one example that I'm showing here. And this is a potato that where a browning uh, has been reduced and much of potato again, once it is cut, uh, it accumulates uh, phenolics very quickly and browns and needs to be thrown away. And this is one example where uh, uh, we, we can conserve and improve the marketability. Genome editing has also been used to develop better beer. Who doesn't like a better beer? And this is an example from uh, Australia in barley. And finally, one of the most important challenge facing humanity today is a global climate change. It's due to a variety of reasons. And the most important negative effect of global climate change is on agriculture because of the increased, uh, d increased disease, lower yields, and lower nutritive quality. And again, here, genome editing has shown value that we can develop crop plants that can tolerate uh, high soil conditions, for instance, and uh, uh, but there is even a company that is trying to, to, to see if we can grow rice, uh, this Israeli company, if we can grow rice in seawater. And so these are just some of the examples that I'm showing uh, how we can develop crops uh, against uh, uh, global climate change. This is a, a, a Arabidopsis with very deep root system that is developed. So it can be a very valuable trait for drought tolerance. Uh, if it, it could be done in many crop plants. And this is a high temperature tolerance uh, uh, gene editing that is done in tomato here. And, uh, and we, we know uh, the temperature increase is common. And we have seen in the past 10 years how this is uh, our temperatures all across India has increased. And one of the most important effect it's going to be is already in agriculture we can see. So we have a potential here, a tool that would help improve for our crop plants to be more resilient to all these uh, you know, parts of climate change, including flooding uh, that is seen here in, in a plant, a, a rice plant from Orissa is known to have the greatest flooding uh, tolerance of any rice and, uh, and those traits can be easily, be, by studying the trait, we can uh, edit the same gene in many of the other rice varieties and make them also uh, uh, tolerant to flooding. And finally, we, we know this is the year of millets and the Prime Minister Modi uh, has been very uh, gung-ho and, and, and advocating for millets rightfully because they are very hardy, very nutritious, but they are not necessarily uh, highly productive and also suffer from uh, resistant uh, susceptibility to diseases and pests. And by taking many of our hardy millet varieties we can make them productive very quickly and, and bring about a greater improvement in the resilience of Indian agriculture and also contribute to the, uh, the, contribute to the nutrition. So genome editing has, as I have shown, 
can in increase the crop productivity, it can increase the nutrient levels of our crops, it can make our crops more resilient to climate, it can build in a greater uh, disease and pest resistance, and it can also bring about an element of food safety, improve the food quality, and uh, also eliminate some of the undesirable effects uh, elements in our food, such as the, the neurotoxins that we see in Kesar dal, and then the tox and the cyanide that we see in sorghum and cassava. And so, uh, as I said, the many countries and those countries that are in the green here, uh, they regulate gene edited crops uh, as, uh, as almost a conventional new varieties of land building with very little of regulation. And so we are very fortunate that India has moved forward in a very science-based fashion to regulate or deregulate GMOs and, and so if we foster uh, productive increased research, increased funding for genome editing, uh, I think India can benefit. But we also need to ensure that as scientists, we need to communicate as to what this uh, technique is. This is essentially a, an advanced mutagenesis technique that we have been using radiation and chemicals for inducing mutations for over 100 years now in a very safe manner. We have used all kinds of other techniques of plant breeding. So this is just one other more science-based, more knowledge-based, but more precise way to develop plants. And we need to make sure that we provide evidence on the safety and address any specific concerns and acknowledge any ethical concerns that we may have that we, as many, if, if people are uncomfortable with the use of modern techniques but most importantly, we need to highlight the benefits of these techniques like I have done now and bring about a greater dialogue amongst the various stakeholders. Be very transparent about any risks that the technique may have. So, and so far, there is none, but clearly delineate the benefits and work collaboratively with uh, all the stakeholders, especially the farming community, the, the, the media, and to, to, to the scientific community in a way to help uh, address uh, to make about we bring about good policy changes in the acceptance of this, and uh, and and this I will I'll be sharing uh, my slides uh, with the organizers, and so please feel free to share share with them, uh, share with the audience uh, uh, the whole slides, and uh, I'll be very happy to take any questions uh, if there is any. But I do thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Do we have any questions for him? Any question? Yes, sir. So we have one question. Please be there to answer it. Thank you, sir. Regards, sir. Mostly, sir, it was a nice presentation and also a good milestone that uh, gene editing will offer to go for uh, uh, also disease resistance. Particularly, I am plant pathologist and uh, it will take care against uh, blast disease, other disease also. Sir, another thing, uh, till now, research has been done vividly by different uh, rice researchers, plant pathologists and also breeders throughout the country and also world. But till now, no resistant genotype has been developed against a seed blight disease in rice called by Rajukhtina Sulani Kumi. So, sir, whether this gene editing will achieve in that aspect. So, if he, by gene editing, will he develop the seed blight resistant variety, then it will be a good milestone. Second question, sir, whether gene editing or a development of a gene edited crops whether it will have any harmful effect on uh, human body after uh, consuming that uh, crop grains? It's my two questions, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much, uh, sir. I appreciate the question. I did not specifically uh, uh, get the name of the disease that you talked about, but I'm not a rice. Uh, I'm, I have worked in plant pathology for both of my master's and PhD. And so I have some uh, good understanding of many of the diseases and disease resistance breeding. So uh, I am pretty sure that uh, the specific disease that you mentioned, although I'm not familiar with it, 
uh, one could develop resistance to that. It requires basic research and understanding of the, the disease resistance, and, and uh, it requires a considerable genomic knowledge uh, of, uh, of that uh, particular uh, resistance to the gene. Once, it's de once that knowledge is developed, then I am very confident through gene editing one could develop resistance uh, to that particular disease. And secondly, in terms of the harmful effects, you see uh, a, a particular plant will have about 3 billion nucleotides, as you know, and through gene editing, we are just changing literally one or two nucleotides in that. And so the level of change is so small, we do not expect any harmful effects. But nevertheless, uh, if there are some pleiotropic effects of where, for instance, uh, we know a, for a, there is one classic case of develop, resist, developing a powdery mildew resistance uh, in, uh, in barley led to the susceptibility to one other disease. So things like that might happen, and so we, we must follow the regular plant breeding uh, testing in whatever means we develop the genotype or the germplasm. And so even in gene editing, all the plant breeding protocols must be followed to make sure that there are no negative uh, traits associated with any development of the positive trait through gene editing. And so far, all the results have been very good. And when you, you know, when you breed your uh, rice, when you cross it with a wild rice, or when you are breeding tomato for resistance to nematode, and then you cross it with wild tomatoes, you literally, you disrupt the whole genome. You, gen you disrupt the, uh, probably thousands of genes are changed, right? The, the alleles, but in, in contrast, gene editing requires a very minor, minuscule change, and so we do not expect uh, any harmful effects uh, in, in most of the time, Sir. according to science, yeah, thank you. Sir, uh, we have also advanced uh, uh, with respect to breeding aspect in our National Rice Research Institute, with uh, mm -hmm. taking the help of our rice breeders and we plant pathologists, uh, are proceeding uh, to go for a QTL mapping with the background of uh, uh, most susceptible cirpulite uh, variety toposini and uh, uh, sorry, uh, Sorna sub one. So that uh, uh, we are thinking that uh, we in future we will get a cirpulite resistant variety. And also, sir, biotechnologists are there. We are so taking their help also. Sir, thank you. Mm. You are a nice presentation and also. Thank you, and I wish you good luck with your breeding. Thank you, sir. Any more questions? Uh, yes. So there will be one last question for you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I was fascinated by your report, and I would like to ask some questions. Like, uh, was there any of those genome-edited crops that you mentioned already produced largely? And the second question is... Uh, uh, sorry, can you repeat that again? The first question again. Okay. So is there w any of those genome-edited crops you mentioned earlier are being produced widely now? Uh -huh. And second is that, is there any incidence that those edited uh, genome become resistant to disease but susceptible to pests? To insects. Very good, and thank you very much. Yeah, this is a very new technique. While literally, uh, you, you will see thousands of research papers have been published just in the last couple of years on this. Uh, the commercialization of this is just beginning. Uh, we have one variety, uh, a, a nutritionally improved variety of rice, uh, uh, sorry, tomato that has been released for public in Japan, and also an herbicide tolerant. Uh, varieties of soybean that have been released in Canada. And so, but in the next couple of, but when we look at into the USDA approval process and the application process, there is a, a literally dozens of, dozens of uh, genome edited crops that are being going to be released for commercial cultivation in the next couple of years. That is my further answer to your first question. And again, second question, uh, if it's a one, if it develops a resistance to your disease, can it develop resistance to a particular pest? Uh, that can only happen if that particular gene has a pleiotropic effect. 
uh, you see if, uh, and then uh, we do know there are occasionally there are genes like that where uh, uh, when you when you bring about a positive change there may be a, an associated negative change but in those cases we would not be using those we would not be editing such genes because we do not want to bring any new complication so whether you use gene editing whether you use hybridization or mutagenesis you need to uh, do perform extensive testing of your plants uh, and your uh, populations uh, uh, through regular breeding procedure and uh, and if when we do that if there are any such susceptibility we are going to we are going to detect